welcome to the GTM Talks Invasives Not in Your Backyard. Um, today's talk will be provided by myself, Caitlin Dietz, and my wonderful partner in invasive fighting crime, Kelly Ucia. Um, we'd also love to know who all has joined us today. So if you can find your chat box, please share with us your name, where you're tuning in from, and share with us what you think the plant in the background of this slide is. And I know several of you probably know this because you've helped out with some removal of this. So if you do, you know, you can share your answer with your friends who are also on the line. Ooh, Irene. She got it right off of the bat. Irene Kaufman says it's Brazilian pepper. <laughs> I love the question mark though. Like she wasn't quite confident in that answer. <laughs> well, you will of see course. plenty of pictures of it later today, Irene. So you'll feel more confident in your answer in the future. Welcome everybody. So we have some folks tuning in from Ponte Vedra Beach. We have Sally from Gainesville. Kurt Foot from Fort Matanzas National Monument, and Kurt definitely knows what some Brazilian pepper looks like. So good to have everybody on. And feel free to keep introducing yourselves in the chat box. Um, and we will go ahead and get going. So to share a little bit about myself, uh, my name is Caitlin Dietz and I'm the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the GTM Research Reserve. I am based out of the Visitor Center up in the Ponte Vedra Beach office. Um, with the Coastal Training Program, I have the opportunity to really dive into a variety of topics. Um, I do a little bit of work in sea level rise and climate change, a little bit of work in cultural resources and archaeological sites, um, and I get to do a little bit of work with invasive species, which is always exciting and I get to learn a lot every time I go outside. I serve as the co-chair of the First Coast Invasive Working Group, which I'll share a little bit more about later. And over the past four to five years, um, I've grown to strongly dislike some of the plants that I see as I drive around town. Um, and possibly after today's webinar, you too will be able to quickly identify some of our common offenders of invasive plants. And it will, I will pass my dislike on to you all and you will also see them every time you drive around. Um, the GTM Research Reserve, for those of you who are new to who or what we are, um, it is one of 29 national estuarine research reserves around the country. Um, the reserve system was established through the Coastal Zone Management Act, and it covers about 1.3 million acres of estuaries. Um, each of the reserves is located in a coastal state. Um, and so there are 29 that you can see on the map in front of you guys. Um, and we all focus on stewardship of our coastal resources, research and monitoring for conservation and management, and educational opportunities that um, we bring to decision makers as well as students and adults to help learn more about our estuarine system in our coastal community. Each reserve does have a federal partner and a state partner. The reserve system's federal partner is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. And here in the state of Florida, our state partner is the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and then locally at the GTM Research Reserve, we have a local supporter, the Friends of the GTM Reserve, and they're actually the host of today's GTM Talks webinar series. And I would like to go ahead and introduce our wonderful partner in invasive fighting crime, Kelly Ucia, with St. John's County, and I'll let Kelly introduce herself. So I work for St. John's County. There's a map of it here on your screen. You can see we run all the way from Ponte Vedra down to just before Marine Land, over to the Hastings area and up into Fruit Cove. 
We have a wide variety of ecosystems within that area because we are bordered on the eastern side with the Atlantic Ocean. We then have the intercoastal and our marsh habitat that run, you know, right along the inside there. And then we also have the St. John's River. So we have invasives in, in all different types of habitats um, here in St. John's County. Um, some are more um, a pain in the rear than others. Uh, but we do kind of run the gamut depending on what properties we're working on and where they're located in the county. So specifically, I work for the Parks and Rec Department. Uh, Caitlin, if you want to go to the next slide. Our Parks and Rec Department is incredibly diverse. So there's a whole section of the department that handles things like all of our ball fields and community centers and pools. Um, and then we have beach access points and playgrounds. I really specialize and work in our passive park areas. So our um, beaches, our trails, our waterway access points. And then I occasionally dabble into some of our active recreation sites where I can work on projects there to ensure that maybe we're utilizing the best plants in our landscaping that are a little more um, Florida friendly and native. We actually just finished a massive landscaping project last week that is all native and Florida friendly plants and removed some of these invasive species that were kind of uh, weaved into our landscaping. So uh, here at Parks and Recreation, we're working really hard to move towards um, managing more invasive species and removal and eradication where possible. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so throughout today's presentation, we're going to give you a little bit of information about invasive species, um, what's being done to help manage invasive species, and then we'll go over a couple of those common offenders that we see regularly in St. John's County. Um, so an invasive species is an introduced or non-native organism. Um, it can be a disease, a parasite, a plant or an animal, and it begins to spread or expand from its range um, of the original introduction. And a lot of times these invasive plants, or most of the time, these invasive plants cause harm to um, the environment, the economy, and sometimes to human health. Um, and when they're introduced, when these invasive plants are introduced into our ecosystems, um, a lot of times they don't have natural predators or an ability or something to help control the population. And so they can repopulate and breed or spread or produce seeds and start to quickly take over natural areas. Um, and depending on whether it's a plant or animal, um, the native species often do not have defenses against these um, introduced plants or animals, and they're not able to compete. Um, sometimes invasive plants or invasive wildlife species um, prey on native species, um, or if it's a plant, uh, invasive plant. They will compete for resources such as sunlight or water. Um, and they really do change the food web within an ecosystem by destroying or replacing native resources. So they can be detrimental to the natural biodiversity of an ecosystem. Um, and sometimes if it's in a really aggressive invasive plant species, it can completely um, decimate a natural area and create a monoculture. Um, and when it does that, you know, it doesn't really provide the food source for any wildlife. Um, it sometimes can change the soil chemistry, altering what else can grow in that native or natural ecosystem. Um, and sometimes our invasive plants that are coming in can increase wildfire intensities. Um, they might burn hotter, they might burn faster. Um, so these invasive plants really are creating a, or they're disrupting that balance of our natural ecosystems. And invasive species can, like I said, be diseases, they can be plants, they can be animals. Um, several of the 
top invasive plants here in the state of Florida um, that you guys have probably seen in the headlines um, are Burmese pythons or feral hogs, Cuban tree frogs, um, the tegu lizards, um, iguanas, and there's plenty more. <laughs> um, but invasive species are not just limited to land where we see them. They're also um, in the waterways. There are aquatic plants that are considered invasive like water, let water lettuce or um, feathered mosquito fern. Um, and then there are also invasive animals within the waterways um, like lionfish, which I'm sure you guys have seen photos of. Um, or you've heard about the lionfish rodeos where they try to capture as many lionfish and remove them from the ecosystems. Um, or green mussels, which are sometimes found in our oyster beds here in Northeast Florida. An aquatic um, invasive species can disrupt the waterways, they can uh, harm boating activity, um, and they can really change the food web and the ecosystem of our estuaries here. Um, today, though, we are going to focus on invasive plants and invasive terrestrial or upland plants for the most part, um, because those are the ones that we often see in our backyards, in our front yards, as we're driving down the roadways. Um, we'll still share with you guys um, at the end of this some resources for aquatic um, plants and animals and um, can always help answer any questions, but today we're just gonna focus on those invasive plants that we have. So first thing I wanna talk about is the characteristics of invasive plants. So we have lots of plants here that are not from Florida and there are specific characteristics which um, make certain plants more prone to being invasive. And these are just kind of a general listing of characteristics. One is that they're tolerant of a variety of soil types. Um, here in St. John's County, we're mainly gonna have really sandy soil, um, but even the types of soil and maybe the pH of the soil is going to vary depending on where you are. They lack predators, right? There's nothing keeping them in check. So wherever they're originally from, Madagascar, Asia, South America, they have some Something that allows them to stay more or less contained where they don't explode and go everywhere. Um, allelopathic is a super fancy science word that basically just means it changes the soil chemistry and it makes it so other plants don't want to grow around them. They basically stake off an area and say this is mine, nothing else is growing here and that's obviously not a good thing. Um, they're tolerant of a wide variety of weather conditions. We have a rainy season here and a dry season and they kind of have to be able to handle both. Um, in certain areas, especially along our 42 miles of uh, beach here and our intercoastal areas, they have to be tolerant to the salt conditions as well. A key, these last two are key and pretty much but they're also very good at their success rate. So not only are they sending lots of seeds, lots of prop propagules, no, those are mangroves, uh, lots of seeds, lots of um, baby plants out into the world, um, but they're becoming very successful. So like certain species, you know, each seed has like, a 98% chance survival rate. That's insane. Um, and then they're fast growing. So especially in areas that are disturbed, um, that we have either cleared for development or that are naturally disturbed due to things like hurricanes, they'll move in really quick and just establish. And they're really fast growing and taking over those areas. So those are just some general characteristics of some of the plants we're gonna talk about today. So when we talk about invasive species, you might think, you know, okay, it's a big problem and it's important, but why, why should I care? Why do I really need to be mindful of what is growing out there? Because a lot of times, you know, they look pretty and it's green, so why disrupt that? Um, well, it's important because managing our invasive species helps us protect our natural resources that we enjoy experiencing. The reason that we're all here, the reason that we go outside and volunteer or explore our natural resources. Um, more than 4,000 plant species are found here in Florida. 
And of those, about 1,300 of them are considered non-native or exotic, meaning that they have been introduced from other states or other countries. And of those, there are over 100 of them that are quickly spreading through our natural areas in the state of Florida. 100, that's a lot. And for land managers, that's overwhelming. <laughs> um, FWC, which is the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, estimates more than 1.7 million acres of Florida's natural areas are infested with invasive species. And according to the U.S. Forest Service, invasive species have contributed to the decline of 42% of the threatened and endangered species. Um, now that's not including just plants, that's plants and animals, but invasive species are really having a detrimental impact on our native wildlife that we see. Um, not only that, they, it costs money. Um, <laughs> herbicide and labor and uh, management of this of these invasive species costs money and um, it's estimated that invasive species um, contribute to about 120 billion dollars um, worth of economic damages whether that's forestry that has been lost agriculture that has been impacted um, or just general maintenance of these invasive species for these natural areas. Um, and we'll go through why in just a second. Florida is ranked number two in the United States for number of invasive species. Can anybody guess and share in the chat box um, what the number one state in the US is for invasives? Ooh, Kurt, Kurt is fast. He got it, it's Hawaii. <laughs> um, so, and we'll talk in just a little bit why Florida is number two in the U.S. So, um, as we talked about, Florida is right behind Hawaii. And what are the two things we pretty much have in common with Hawaii? Um, we are a peninsula, and so we have a lot of boat traffic. So, Florida is the point of entry for almost three quarters of the plants that are imported to the United States. And we also are very warm and very tropical or subtropical. And so things love to come here, including people and the plants that maybe they used to have inside of their house that were beautiful, but you know, winter, uh, those plants couldn't survive. Well, now they can have those plants outside. And so we have a lot of plants that quote unquote escaped. I love that term, but that's in a lot of the scientific papers and um, that these plants escaped um, from people's backyards and potted plants. And so unfortunately, a lot of these plants were were intentional introductions where we brought them in for a very specific purpose. So um, like Malaluca, we brought in specifically to drain the swamps of South Florida. Uh, that obviously ended really well for us. Um, and we brought in a lot of these other plants that Caitlin and I are going to talk about, usually because they're very ornamental and they're very pretty and we didn't fully understand the impacts of what would happen when these plants got into the, our natural areas. Um, on top of all of that, we grow a lot of plants here. So we have an incredibly large plant nursery. It makes sense. We have a much longer growing season. Our, our seasons are much more hospitable to growing plants um, than other northern states. So we have an idea of how they got here. There's a bunch of different mechanisms. I will tell you number one is like, we did it. We brought them here uh, usually on purpose. Um, and then once they're here, how do they spread? How do these problems get out of hand so quickly? Well, the first three are very natural instances in which they spread, right? Wind spread, wind spread seeds, water spread seeds. Um, animals also spread lots of seeds. Um, those birds like to eat especially some of these berries on these plants that we will talk about and they come out the other end nice and fertilized. Um, not so great for us. And then the bottom three here are really, um, we can point the finger at ourselves. So equipment, a lot of times um, when we have people come in and do invasive species removal, we actually have to inspect their equipment before they come on property because we don't want them coming from their last job and tracking in seeds of a species that maybe we don't have on our property. Um, and so when we utilize these mowers and things, especially in right-of-ways, and we're moving 
uh, from one site to the next to the next without washing or rinsing off our equipment, we're transporting seeds. Um, clothing and shoes are also um, good at spreading invasive species. If you've ever walked through a patch of Caesar weed, um, you will come out covered uh, <laughs> in Caesar weed and you can easily take that to another site if you don't clean off your clothing in between site visits. And once again, um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, we also intentionally continue to plant a lot of these species in new areas where we didn't have them before, providing a new seed source to some of our natural areas. So hopefully we've convinced you that invasive plants are bad um, and that it is a pretty big problem. Um, so you're probably wondering, uh, is there anything being done to help? And I'm really glad you guys all asked that question in your head. I knew that that's what you were thinking. Um, so there are several actions being taken um, to help prevent the spread of invasive, invasive plant species um, through federal and state regulations, through councils, volunteer organizations, um, there are several distribu uh, distribution mapping systems that are out there for land managers and for community members. Um, and then educational opportunities like this one to help make sure that everybody is aware of what invasive species are, um, what they look like, and what they can do to help, um, you know, control the invasive species spread and help protect our natural areas and promote that natural biodiversity that we all love. So at the federal level, um, there is a federal noxious weed act among several others that, um, that regulate the transportation of invasive species across state lines. They also prohibit the sales of some invasive species, um, but you'll see in a little bit that not all invasive species are um, federally or state regulated. Um, and within the state of Florida, there are, um, there are also a, there are regulations that also apply. Um, in fact, there are 47 states within the country that do have lists of plants that are considered noxious, or that word can be interchanged with invasive. Um, and those are plants that can't be sold or transported or propagated unless authorized by a permit. Um, so when we do invasive species work, we have a permit through the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services that give us the um, authorization to bring an invasive plant to an educational opportunity or to collect an invasive plant to send it for vouchering. Um, in the state of Florida, um, the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services is the responsible agency for protecting our plant industries in our native plant life. Um, and they do that through regulations as well as um, detection and eradication and educational opportunities. They're also the ones that really help with biocontrols or um, releasing and investigation of using uh, um, animals or insects to help control the populations. Um, and then the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission also has some. Um, but as I mentioned, not every plant is included in this. And unfortunately, it literally does take act of Congress to list some of these species. And most of the species that are currently listed are in these listings because they um, impact transportation, which is a huge, you know, economic supporter of, um, of our industries out there. Um, there is also a council here in the state of Florida. It was formerly the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council. They've recently changed the name to the Florida Invasive Species Council, but everything is still listed as FLEPSI. Um, and this council compiles invasive species lists and they're revised every two years. And professional botanists and others within the invasive plant community perform exhaustive studies to really help determine what invasive exotic plants should be listed. And these are plants that we really try to discourage um, 
and try to promote educational opportunities for. Um, they have different categories and you can see here a category one listed species is one where the, the plant has really altered of a native community and has displaced native species and changed the community structure or ecological functions. Um, and a category two is really kind of just an alert, like, hey guys, this is an invasive species that is out there. We've noticed an increase in abundance, but it's not quite altered our native community, so keep an eye on it. And we'll send you the list of the invasive plants that are currently on our FLEPC list. So that way, if you are going out and looking to do some native plantings or invasive identifications, you'll have a list of ones that we are really encouraging everybody to stay away from. And then Kelly and I are also a part of a um, voluntary group called the First Coast Invasive Working Group and it's a cooperative weed management area and we have them throughout the entire state of Florida. The First Coast Invasive Working Group was established back in December of 2006 and we work across federal, state, and local, and some private lands um, to help manage invasive species. And it's one of many of the statewide partnerships that really help to control invasive species. And our group works within Baker, Clay, Duval, and Nassau and St. Johns counties. And if you're interested in joining the group, let Kelly or I know afterwards and we'll make sure we get you on our mailing list. So with that, you guys are ready to learn about some invasive species that could be in your backyard? All right. Well, I honestly hate starting with this one because everybody loves Mexican petunia. Um, it has that really attractive purple and blue flower. Um, it can grow up to three feet tall. It really takes over your beds. You can get it at your local distribution center. Um, it does a great job growing and filling in the beds and a lot of times you can use it for edging, um, but Mexican petunia is an invasive plant. Um, it can escape from your garden beds at home. <laughs> yeah, Kelly, the keyword escape. Um, and it will, can grow into natural areas where it really crowds out the native species. The photo at the bottom of this slide, you can see that entire bottom area is all Mexican petunia. And it's really um, taken over this natural area. It can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions. Um, so it can tolerate different types of light. Um, it can grow really fast. Uh, Kelly said earlier prolific reproduction is a key characteristic of invasives. Mexican petun petunia um, produces a lot of seeds and it can establish through the rhizomes, so through the roots. <laughs> so I see Kelly said it's impossible to get rid of. And yes, it absolutely is challenging to get rid of. Um, you really have to pull out those big roots that are at the bottom of that. Um, because Mexican petunia can re-sprout if you leave anything in the ground. Um, so we'll go through some of our common invasives and then we'll share with you some of the alter natives um, that we recommend that we like using. Um, and then we'll also towards the end talk about where you can find some removal tips if you do find that you have some of these invasives in your backyard. Um, so Wild petunia is a great alternative. It's very challenging to find. Um, there are also some sterile cultivars of Mexican petunia. Um, and I believe some of the sterile cultivars come in white and pink, but you really need to make sure and trust who you're purchasing your Mexican petunia from to make sure that it is the sterile variety. Um, 
honestly, in my opinion, I would just not try to go with the sterile version or the wild version and go for some alternatives. I personally like the purple cone flower. Um, it still gives you the height of the Mexican petunia and it has a really great purple color and will attract a lot of native um, pollinators too. So the next one we're going to talk about is my arch nemesis um, and some of you were part of a community work day we had earlier this year that we will have again at the beginning of the next year when we can be together in person. Um, but this plant is terrible. Uh, this is called Kalanchoe, also known as Mother of Millions, which pretty much tells you everything you need to know about this plant. So if you can tell in the upper picture here, each leaf, which in this top picture is rounded, but in the bottom picture you can see that the leaves are flat, there are little nodes on the ends or on the surrounding of each of those leaves that produces a baby plantlet. Those little baby plantlets drop off and they go into the soil and they form their own plants. So you literally can sit on a towel and hand pull baby plants and cow and it for like a solid 30 minutes and not really even move. I can tell you this from personal experience. Um, and this plant's really bad because it starts to form what we call carpets. Um, it'll go underneath some plants and kind of take over entire areas, especially in our dune systems. And that's not good. So if you've ever helped me pull Kalanchoe or you've seen us give this talk before, we usually have Kalanchoe with us. And I'll have a huge big plant that'll be like this big and then the roots will be this big. It'll be super tiny roots because they're very easy to hand pull. And if you know anything about our dune systems, you know we want plants with big massive root systems to hold those dunes in place in the event of storms. If we have a bunch of teeny tiny little cow and coey roots, that's not going to do anything when a storm comes. And so we want to make sure that we have the best plants in our dune system at possible. Uh, this plant is also toxic to animals, so it's not like our gopher tortoise friends who live in the dunes can eat these plants. Um, they're just all around terrible, and more or less the only method right now that we know of that to remove it is hand pulling. Uh, this is a plant that you can get in the store, so any of the plants that we talk about that have the little store icon in the bottom, you can go out and purchase. It's uh, totally legal, but we recommend that you please don't. And if you're going to go ahead and remove it, there's almost nothing that will look similar to Kalanchoe. It's a very, very unique. But the beauty of Kalanchoe is how easy it is to grow. And that's why most people get it. Um, in fact, it is so easy to grow that after you hand pull it, put it in a black contractor bag and put it in a closet for several months, it will still continue to grow with no sunlight and no water. Um, and so if you want a plant that's that easy to grow, um, century plants or anything really in the agave family, beach sunflower, put it in a sunny spot and you're never going to touch it again. That thing will take right off. And then our native prickly pear cactus. So put it somewhere that um, is away from where you may be walking or interacting with it because it does have those spines, but it's incredibly easy to grow and provides awesome, awesome um, wildlife food like for our gopher tortoise. The next one, I also see a whole bunch in our dunes. It's asparagus fern. It is a category two species, but we do see it having a big impact in our coastal areas. Fun fact for you, it is not actually a fern. It got its name asparagus fern because it looks like a fern, but it's more closely related to lilies. Um, these guys basically are huge round almost bushes when they're full grown in our natural areas and there's really nothing growing around them. Uh, they spread through those beautiful red berries that the birds send out the other end fertilized for us and these asparagus fern thankfully are fairly easy to remove but when they're in really large numbers like we have in some of our sites um, it can become exponentially more difficult. If it's just one or two that you have in your yard I recommend you just go ahead and get rid of it. Also please don't buy them in the store. They come a lot in hanging form um, and little hanging baskets as well. If you have asparagus fern and you want to replace it with something that's similar, what's kind of unique about asparagus fern is kind of that fluffy texture that it has to it. And so Stokes Aster is an awesome alternative, plus you'll get these beautiful purple flowers. Um, Kunti fern, which is native, which is a very slow growing plant, but 
This plant can take a beating and can really handle a wide variety of conditions. So there's minimal maintenance involved in maintaining a cootie. And then there's also the dwarf yawpaw and holly that are another good option for you if you're kind of looking for that rounded bush look. Um, I'll go really quickly over this one. Um, this is elephant ear. It looks very similar to taro. Um, and the distinguishing feature where you can tell the difference between the two is where the leaf attaches to the leaf stalk. Um, but for, day, for today, don't worry about the difference because they're both invasive. <laughs> so you don't want either one of them. Um, what's unique about elephant ear is that a lot of um, folks use the tubers um, for eating. Um, so it is edible. It's a popular food source. Um, once you harvest the tubers, they can be stored for several weeks. Um, unfortunately, though, elephant ear is very aggressive and it will quickly grow and outcompete and shade a lot of that native vegetation that we like. Um, I see this a lot when I'm driving around in um, drainage ditches or where there's some good water sources. Um, so it's something just to keep an eye on if you have it. Um, they are relatively easy to pull out. <laughs> so you can do that on your own. And there are some gorgeous native plants to replace that with. Um, a personal favorite of mine is pitcher plant. Um, but if you like some different colors and something that uh, does enjoy a more wet area, um, golden canna and a blue flag iris are also recommended. One of the invasive plants that I work, <laughs> that I sp have spent a lot of time removing is beech vitex. Um, this is a relatively new invasive species to our area. Um, it is very common in the Carolinas. So if you are from North Carolina or South Carolina, you likely have seen this. Um, fortunately, right now in St. John's County, there are only two locations where it has been observed. Um, one of those locations it has been treated and eradicated. In the other location, it is coming back. And we have been treating it for four years now, I believe. Um, but beach vitex grows in our sand dunes. It tolerates droughts. It tolerates the salt spray from the ocean. Um, and while it looks like it's providing a really great vegetative cover for those sand dunes, um, similar to Kalanchoe, beach vitex does not have a very deep root system. It's very shallow. So you can pull up the runners very easily, which as Kelly mentioned, we, is something that we don't want in our dune systems. Um, not only that, these runners cross over each other and can really entangle some of our nesting sea turtles. As the adult females come to nest, they can get entangled in this beach vitex. Um, so if you do see it, please reach out to us. This is a species that we can, we call it's early detection rapid response. So it's one of those because it's so rare or it's very limited in our community. The second that we see it, we do wanna to try to get out there and treat it immediately to stop the spread of it. And there are some beautiful alternatives for beach vitex, including the railroad vine, which is thriving right now if you've been out onto our beaches. And it'll still give you that really pretty purple flower and nice runners that go across the dune. So the next one here is incredibly common in landscaping, especially in our coastal areas. So this is called silver thorn. And once you start to develop an eye for it, you'll start to see it everywhere, just like I do. The underside of the leaf has a silvery tint and that's where it gets its name from. And typically these are trimmed into really nice hedges. And when they're not trimmed, or they've gone a little bit without being trimmed, they start to get almost like they stuck their finger in a light socket. Like they start to get all of these crazies kind of growing out of the um, hedge there. And so these guys, once again, very prolific in our coastal areas. They are not from here. They're native to China and Japan. 
And in our coastal areas, because we obviously aren't out there hedging them, um, they can actually grow into vines and climb on trees and harm vegetation. And on our coastal dune systems, they can form into like really large bushes um, and once again start to grow on some of our native vegetation like vines. And so that's not a good thing. We don't want a plant like this kind of taking over our good vegetation that we want in our areas. So if you're going to get rid of silver thorn, um, some of the alternatives that we can suggest are sea grape. I love sea grape. So if you're someone who enjoys silver thorn because of the uniqueness of the silvery color, uh, look for sea grape. It has a really unique, really round, beautiful leaf um, that can be hedged um, if you start trimming it uh, early enough. Simpson Stopper is amazing for hedges. It gets these awesome, awesome red berries on it that the birds love. I have one in my office and uh, it, those berries don't stay on there for very long. Those birds are all over it. So they're awesome wildlife. And then wax myrtle trees, if you're looking for something that's gonna be a little bigger and a little bushier. Another common invasive plant that guilty I do have in my backyard is Chinese tallow. Um, it was brought over from China for its seed oil and is considered an ornamental and that seed oil um, used to be used to make soap. Um, what's really it's considered ornamental because it does look nice when it is growing. It will grow fast and it has a really attractive fall color. Um, unfortunately though, it, the seeds that are dispersed and the roots do not, um, they really out compete anything around it. Um, it has those allelopathic properties that Kelly mentioned. So in the one in my backyard, you can see kind of a ring forming around the Chinese tallow tree where more Chinese tallow trees are starting to come in. Um, and it prevents anything else from growing nearby it. Um, the leaves, unfortunately, and the fruit can be toxic. Um, if you have Chinese tallow near an agricultural setting, um, the leaves and the fruit can be toxic to cattle. Um, and it can also be harmful to humans. Um, so if you decide you want to try eating this, because there are some folks who, you know, I, you know, there are great edible properties and edible plants out in our community. Please don't try to eat this one um, because it can cause an upset stomach um, and really make you feel ill. Um, there are some great alternatives to Chinese tallow if you really like the, the look of it as it starts to grow out. Um, I personally love a red maple tree and I also have one of those in my backyard and it still gives you that light green color um, and it'll grow nice and full. Um, and the last invasive plant species that Kelly and I want to share with you guys all today is Brazilian pepper. And that was the plant that we shared with you at the very beginning of today's webinar. Um, Brazilian pepper is starting to really take over a lot of the natural area here in St. Johns County. Um, it was brought to Florida in the 1800s as an ornamental and since then infest over 700,000 acres here in Florida. Um, if you are from South or Central Florida, you are very familiar with it. And if you are further down in St. Johns County, you are starting to see it more. Um, to date, the northernmost Brazilian pepper tree, um, and it's actually a lot of them, are up in the Fernandina Beach area. So that's as far as they have started to spread. This is a really tall, multi-trunked tree. Um, sometimes it's considered a shrub, but in the areas that I've seen it, it's about 30 feet tall. So it's pretty, pretty high. <laughs> um, they do flower in September and they do have fruits or those red berries that usually mature in December. And it really is one of the most aggressive and widespread invasive plant species here in Florida. Um, 
it shades out all of our native plants. And to be honest, the red berries do not provide nutritional value for our native wildlife. Um, so these are just a couple of photos of the Brazilian pepper in different stages. So you can see it as a seedling, as well as when it starts to become a more mature tree and starts to kind of look like finger-like projections coming out of the, out of the trunk of the tree. Um, and Kelly actually has a great example of an invasive removal project that she's worked on with Brazilian pepper. So um, this is one of our beach walkover sites where it was nothing but Brazilian pepper growing. And so we worked with FWC to get um, a grant with them to help with the removal. So we removed it all and then we replaced it with native plants. So that's what it looked like last November after we removed all the Brazilian pepper, cut it down, got rid of it. We didn't wanna leave all of these dead trees there. Um, and so we've gone ahead and replanted with natives. This is last November. And then I went just last week and took a picture of the site. And about 10 months later, this is what it looks like. Um, I have a handful of Brazilian peppers that need to go back and be retreated. I think I counted about three. So I will take it. Uh, I don't have a tunnel on my hands. Um, uh, but there's beautiful, beautiful native plants that are thriving in there. I wish I could get all the pictures of all the amazing things that are in there, but there's, there is coral bean and bee balm and cactuses and all sorts of really cool stuff. And this is going to be a good example of what we can do in the county. And then actually my background is another example of a project. Uh, this planting went in in March and we did that removal, I believe, in about January of this year. And so there are now two good chunks of tracks that were entirely monocultures of Brazilian pepper that we have replanted with native species. And all of the animals and pollinators are so happy at this makes me smile every time I visit both of these sites because it's so beautiful now. And, Kelly and if you have Brazilian pepper and you want to remove it, which I highly encourage you to do, uh, if you're looking for something that has that red berry and a similar look, uh, Yapon Holly, Simpson Stopper, and East Palaka Holly, which is a much larger version than a Yapon Holly, are all awesome alternatives. So if we've gone through these slides and you realize, oh gosh, I think I have some of these invasive plants in my yard. Um, don't worry. <laughs> Hopefully you have gotten through the first step and we have helped you identify what plants you have. Um, and we'll share with you a resource in just a little while um, about removal methods. Um, and then once you remove it, we can also recommend some great natives and a lot of the resources that we'll share with you um, following up with this webinar are some suggestions of what natives to replace your invasives with. And then monitoring for regrowth. So Kelly mentioned last week she went back out and did an assessment of the property and realized that there are some invasive plants that are coming back. And I hate to tell you this, but that is what invasive species do. They will come back. Um, so it is very important to continue to monitor your property for that regrowth. Um, and fortunately, at, with the regrowth, you'll be able to catch them early and it won't take as much of an effort to help remove those invasives. Um, so one of the sites that we do strongly encourage you to visit that we'll send a link to um, for removal techniques and management is the University of Florida's um, IFAS Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. Um, they give you several different types of management techniques. Um, preventative, which oftentimes is don't plant it. <laughs> um, they also give you um, cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical techniques. Um, we, you are always more than welcome to try the mechanical technique first. It'll be a very labor intensive um, and you'll need to make sure you get the full plant out of there and hopefully the mechanical technique will work for you but I will be the first to tell you that invasive plants are invasive for a reason and Kelly shared with you some of those characteristics. Um, so there are some invasive plants that do require chemical uh, management techniques and so this resource will tell you what type of chemical management um, is recommended and then as always make sure that you are following all of the directions on your chemical um, labels to make sure that you're using them appropriately.
And some of these plants are evil, like bristling and pepper. And even if you cut it down, um, it, you have to actually get the chemical applied to it within about five to 10 minutes of cutting it down, or it will heal itself over and regrow from that stump that you just cut to the ground. So um, like Caitlin and I said, we definitely recommend the mechanical, but it's sometimes it's just not an option to manage these plants effectively. So if you're sitting here and you're like, hey, my yard's invasive free, I'm good to go, I don't have to do anything, think again, there are definitely things you can do. One, don't become part of the problem, um, please don't plant them. Two, help with local removal efforts every single year. There's a weed wrangle that happens in our area that the First Coast Invasive Working Group organizes. It's a huge collective work day to remove invasive species from various parts of our First Coast. Educate your neighbors. Now, educate your neighbors that you think would be receptive. Uh, don't go to the guy who's always yelling at people to get off their lawn. Probably not gonna be receptive to you telling him that you have they have Mexican petunia growing in their landscaping and should get rid of it. Um, also with that, if you have a community board for landscaping, which a lot of the large HOAs do, uh, become a member of the board or go speak to the board about utilizing native and Florida friendly plants in your landscaping efforts because you may have invasives in your landscaping of your HOA, or maybe you have some non-natives that require a lot of water and fertilizer that can be replaced with natives that require less effort. And then show support for local removal efforts. If you um, have interest in removing invasive species in our public pro properties and parks um, or you know about them please let us know and when we advertise that we're doing these projects i love a good email of somebody saying i'm doing a good job um, it's way nicer to read than somebody complaining about me trying to do a good job so um, anytime you kind of get those psas about us doing some invasive species removal support that can be shown for the project is always a positive and if you've gone ahead and removed them and you can't remember the altern alternatives we suggested, floridayards.org is an amazing resource where you can go in and pick what type of plant you are looking for, a tree, a flower, a grass, a vine, um, and putting the parameters of your site. Do you have sandy soil? Is it a really shady spot, a really sunny spot? What kind of water do you get? Does it need to be salt tolerant? So kind of put in the conditions of where you're looking to place the plant and just go ahead and hit find plants and it'll generate a whole list of really good um, either Florida native or, and or Florida friendly options that typically are easily sourced at a local nursery. And for those of you who are out in the community, um, all of your eyes are greatly appreciated because land managers are very busy managing their lands and would always appreciate an extra set of eyes out there. Um, there is a phone application or you can also use it through your web browser called I've Got One and it helps with um, marking observances of invasive species and being able to track real time where invasive species are helps monitor the range expansions that we might be experiencing with climate change or with um, increased development or potentially increased you know, pet releases that might be a challenge um, and will really help with developing distribution maps and these uh, observances are used in a lot of the regulation and decision making. Um, so being able to track and provide evidence of where these species are is very helpful. Um, and anybody can use the uh, I've got one app. You don't have to be a land manager. So if you're out there and you see something that looks like it, um, it works very similar to iNaturalist and you upload a photo in your location and it'll send it off to a um, um, a second identifier who can confirm or deny or even go out into the field and just confirm what that plant is. And so with that, Kelly loves or she's used this joke a lot of times and I absolutely love it. So we will go ahead and um, take any questions that you guys might have at this point in time. And it doesn't look like there are any in the chat box. So if you want to raise your virtual hand, um, we would be happy to answer any questions now. Irene, if you want to go ahead and take yourself off mute. 
mute myself. So I have a little show and tell of some things that I believe are invasive. One, All right. Now this has a little story with it. Here, it's stuck in it. So this is Wedelia, Wedelia, which I- That's listed, I, it's invasive. You're on the right track. <laughs> when I first moved here 15 years ago, I bought one little plant at a Kmart, unaware, and a couple of years later, it had taken over. And it took us a long time mechanically to remove just so much of it and again and again. And today, after about a year of not finding any, I found this one outside. Just for today's show and tell. <laughs> yeah, just in time, right? But yes, I'm constantly, Andy and I have to constantly be checking for it um, because it comes back. But yeah. the natives have come in and taken over again for the most part, the dune sunflowers and all. And then this just started popping up this year. This star shaped grass. This is a grass. Okay, and I used to see a lot of these when we were butterfly monitoring um, at the GTM Reserve. And so I believe this is an invasive type of grass, but I might be wrong. And this. I would have to double check. I know there is an invasive um, grass that looks similar to that. It's called crow's foot. Yeah. Um, if I remember correctly though, crow's foot only has four um, little things and it looks like you've got six there. Yeah. But we can definitely yeah. follow up after this, Irene. Yeah, okay. And I do, I have been using iNaturalist and I think I might have silver thorn growing in the dune. I'll have to check on that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Irene. And Linda, I see your hand is also raised. And it looks like you're still muted. Oh, you muted, you unmute, there you go. Unmute. There, unmuted. there we there go. There you go. Okay, yeah, this is Linda and Dave. And uh, we were wondering if, if these plants are on the invasive species list, why are they still for sale? So that's a question we get all the time. Yeah, um, and it goes back to those regulations. Um, not all invasive species are federally or state regulated. Um, and that's because most of the federally or state listed regulated species are the ones that um, impact navigation of our waterways because that's really where a lot of um, transportation and equipment and effort is right now. Um, the goal with the Florida Invasive Species Council um, or what used to be FLEPSI is to the list that they have um, for the category one and category two, it really doesn't hold, have teeth in regulations. It's more of just a, we are really trying to target these plants and they do try to get those included on the regulatory list, um, but it is very challenging. They have, it's, you know, you have to have the distribution, which is why it's so important to document in EDMAPs where we're finding these in space of species and a lot of other requirements um, that just make it challenging to get some of these regulated. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Great question. All right. Any others? All right, well, you do now have our email addresses and we will share these slides with you um, afterwards. We'll also, once we get the recording all cleaned up, send that out to you guys. Um, but before you leave us today, uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna pop a uh, poll up onto your screen. Um, just take a quick poll for us to let us know what you thought about today. Um, we'll stick around for any last questions that you guys might have. And we are very glad that you guys were able to join. And we hope that you take this knowledge from today and share it with your neighbors, your 
your HOA if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, or just, you know, whenever you're out and about checking out some plants. Yeah, hopefully now you're like Caitlin and I and you see them everywhere and they bug you just as much as they bug us. <laughs> and this was just a sampling. Yeah. <laughs> if you're really interested in invasive plants, let us know and um, we'll share everything with you guys. <laughs>